This episode of The Witch Wave is brought to you by Aesthetic Magic. Aesthetic Magic is a creative studio and product line that cultivates healing and magic through art and design, and I absolutely adore them. Check out their bright, colorful products, such as their Prism Oracle, which uses the magic of color to help you tap into your intuition, and their book, Color, Form, and Magic, which delves into the psychology of color and shape in order to help you cultivate your creative spiritual practice. Both are available anywhere books are sold. And Witch Wave listeners can receive 20% off their order by using the offer code WITCH on the Aesthetic Magic site. So go ahead to aestheticmagic.com, that's spelled A-E-S-T-H-E-T-I-C, magic.com, or over on Instagram at aestheticmagic.studio. This episode of The Witch Wave is brought to you by That Witch Life Podcast. The witches at That Witch Life Podcast are hosting That Witch Life Minicon, a one-day virtual conference on March 5th. Join from anywhere for workshops on herbalism, working with the gods, and suburban magic led by That Witch Life Podcast hosts Kanani Soleil, Courtney Weber, and Hilary Whitmore, with a special masterclass on DNA ancestry magic with Stephanie Rose Bird. The conference will include rituals, raffles, and more, so go on and register at thatwitchlife.com and make sure you check out the hilarious That Witch Life podcast on all podcast platforms. This episode of The Witch Wave is brought to you by Blessed Be Magic. Blessed Be Magic is a jewelry brand for the modern witch, creating subtle and tasteful talisman jewelry to remind you of your magic. You're a modern witch living in the real world. And maybe it's not that your lifestyle is a secret, it's just that you're not exactly flying around on a broomstick wearing a pointy hat. And you are not alone. It can be hard to find subtle, witchy jewelry that you feel comfortable wearing every day. But that's why Blessed Be Magic was born. With over 700 five-star reviews, these tasteful talismans are designed to be worn with your existing jewelry collection or on their own. The beauty is, Blessed Be Magic jewelry won't draw unnecessary attention to your secret beliefs. Plus, you'll get to wear a constant reminder of your magic every day. Visit them at www.blessedbemagic.com, and magic is spelled with a C-K at the end, and use code WITCHWAVE for 15% off your first order. Check out Blessed Be Magic's modern take on classic magical symbols such as the Triple Goddess and Pentacle in their minimalist jewelry that you can wear every day, anywhere. Again, visit them at www.blessedbemagic.com, that's magic with a C-K, and use code WITCHWAVE for 15% off your first order. The world is filled with bewitching people, and you might be one too. Welcome to the podcast where art is magic, magic is real, and reality is stranger than dreams. I'm Pam Grossman, and this is The Witch Wave. Hello and welcome to the Witch Wave. Lately, I've been thinking about the concept of metamorphosis. I've been dwelling in this state of suspension, 
a liminal zone where I feel something slowly shifting in me, but I'm not quite sure what will come of it. And until then, all I can do is just be. It reminds me of the tarot card, the hanged one, which tells us to wait, to receive, to surrender. Winter often feels that way for me, but this one especially has been giving me such a sense of in-betweenness. The pandemic is certainly a big contributing factor to it all, but on a personal note, as I've said before, I've finished up some bigger projects, and I'm honestly not quite sure what's next. I have ideas and inklings, but I'm just trying to embrace the notion that right now, things are developing in my unconscious at the pace that they need to. And until then, all I can do is just be present and trust that they'll emerge and that I'll emerge when divine timing deems it all ready. But because I've felt like I've been floating in this chrysalis for a while, I got curious about what actually happens to a caterpillar when it transforms into a marvelous winged thing. And let me tell you, it is so much more interesting and frankly, a lot more intense and severe than all the cliches would have us think. I learned that the caterpillar spins a silky cocoon if it's going to be a moth, or it molts into a chrysalis if it's going to be a butterfly. And while inside this encasement, its body essentially liquefies. It kind of digests itself with enzymes and turns into what scientists sometimes affectionately refer to as bug soup. And here's something truly amazing. The only parts of the caterpillar that don't liquefy are basically the nervous system and these groups of organized cells, which are called imaginal discs. Ah! And these imaginal discs eventually know to turn into everything from antennae to legs to eyes to genitals and yes, to wings. So right now, I'm just chilling in my own version of bug soup and putting faith in my own imaginal discs. And I'm hoping that whatever it is I'm turning into will be beyond my wildest imaginings. Now, what I just told you about my own metamorphosis was a story, albeit one based on scientific fact, but it also had a narrative and a message. And I would argue that the best stories, and certainly my favorite stories, are about transformation. In her magnificent book, Fantastic Metamorphoses, Other Worlds, Marina Warner writes about metamorphosis, quote, as divine fantasy, as vital principle of nature, as punishment, as reprieve, as miracle, as cultural dynamic, as effect of historical meetings and clashes, as the difference that lures, as the lost idol, as time out of time, as a producer of stories and meanings. Unquote. She later writes, quote, We continue to demand that stories be told and told over. We want them to metamorphose themselves from the recipes of the manuals into drama and poems, into novels and texts. We want them not only for themselves, but for how they seed storytellers' imaginations, how they make other stories. Unquote. 
One of the most renowned books of transformation is, of course, Ovid's, or Ovid's, Metamorphoses, a collection of myths about gods turning mortals and demigods into a whole host of things. And today's guest, Nina McLaughlin, has written a marvelous book of her own called Wake Siren, which is her retelling of many of Ovid's stories using a multiplicity of voices and styles, but all from a feminine perspective. Nina's metamorphic stories and her other beautiful writings have left me feeling changed for the better and I believe that after listening to her and reading her work yourself, you will be too. But before we get to that, first, let's check and see what's come through on The Witch Wire. Who is it? Witches! Eleanor writes, Dear Pam, In April 2020, I finished the draft of my first book, a novella in poems called Love Story. It's now clear to me that my book is, in fact, a documentation of a baby witch's awakening. I was so happy with this book. Here's my door, I told myself and others. I finally know what I'm here to do. I still feel this way but I'm getting door after door slammed in my face. I've tried agents, publishers, bookstores, theater directors, public funding, and nothing is shifting. I've worked as a writer my whole adult life. I could take the rejection on the chin with other pieces, but with my book, these knocks are starting to take their toll. Still, despite this, I cannot shake the deep belief that I'm supposed to write these books, that this is how I can impart the lessons about healing I have learned to others, and that this is how I can continue to explore my own healing and magic source. As a witch of words yourself, do you have any words, spells, or wisdom to help me keep the faith on the path to publishing and to stay committed to the labor not the fruit. My main concern is staying connected to my power, which feels like it dims a little with each shut door, despite my best efforts to love, trust, and know myself. Hi, Eleanor. Well, on today's episode, we're talking all about metamorphosis. So I wonder if rather than using an image of a door that you need to walk through or that needs to open for you, you can instead hold onto the image of the chrysalis or the cocoon that you and this book are currently in. I often try to remind myself of the concept of divine timing. And it doesn't come easily to me all the time as someone who is super proactive and into planning and making shit happen. But as you've heard... Sometimes nature, the gods, our imaginal discs, whatever you want to chalk it up to, have their own schedule. So shifting the images or the language or the stories you're telling yourself about the book might help in the meantime. But the other thing I do is I bring my witchcraft practice into my projects all the time. I sometimes petition my muse or muses when I'm looking for inspiration, and I regularly ask spirit to help make my work be a vehicle for the highest good and reach whomever it's meant to reach so that it can be a positive force in the world. And sometimes I do spells to that end and have even put manuscripts on my altar So you may want to do something physical like that with yours as well. Sometimes, though, we don't know why we're doing the work we're called to do or even what its final form is meant to be. There's a TV project I've been working on for the past two years that just recently seems to have hit a bit of a wall. 
People expressed interest and enthusiasm in it, and everything was seeming promising, and the momentum was going, but then it started getting rejections or delays, or I was told, maybe later, the timing's not right, maybe in the future, etc. And it just hasn't found a home yet. But rather than thinking of it as a failure or a dead end, I've been working on reframing the situation. Because I put out the intention that I only want this project to come into fruition if it will do the greatest good. And if not, then I trust that spirit is guiding it and me down a better path. And maybe it's one that I can't even see yet. Now, maybe that was all work that I had to do to prepare myself for a different iteration or a different project altogether. Or maybe this one is just taking its sweet divine time, stewing in its soupy chrysalis until it's ready to grow wings. And maybe that's what's happening with yours as well. But whatever happens, I hope that you'll keep in touch and let me know what emerges. Now, on to my guest. Nina McLaughlin is the author of Wake Siren, Ovid Resung, a retelling of Ovid's metamorphoses told from the perspective of the female figures transformed. She is also a frequent contributor to the Paris Review, where she writes lyric essays on such transformational entities as the dawn, the moon, and the solstices. Her book, Summer Solstice, an essay, is a collection of her summer solstice essays, and it is a wonder. Her first book is the acclaimed memoir, Hammerhead, The Making of a Carpenter. Formerly an editor at the Boston Phoenix, Nina worked for nine years as a carpenter and is now a books columnist for the Boston Globe. In addition to the Paris Review Daily, she has written for the Virginia Quarterly Review, The Believer, The New York Times Book Review, Agni, American Short Fiction, The Los Angeles Review of Books, The Wall Street Journal, Meat Paper, and elsewhere. Now, quick content warning. Because Nina and I are talking about Greek and Roman myths, there is a bunch of sexual abuse rape, and incest in these stories. She and I don't go into graphic detail in our conversation, but we do discuss those topics at some length, so just a heads up. Nina joined me from her home in Cambridge, Massachusetts, via Zoom. Nina McLaughlin, welcome to The Witch Wave. Pam, thank you so much for having me. I'm so excited that you're here. I'm such a fangirl of yours and your writing, so this really feels like kismet. So listen, you have written some of my favorite fiction. You've also written some of my favorite nonfiction. And my plan today is to get into both. But I think we'll start in the space of fiction, of mythology, with your incredible book, Wake Siren, Ovid Resung. Or is it Ovid Resung? That's probably a good place to start because <laughs> I think I've heard it both ways. I've heard it both ways, too. I always say Ovid. I've been doing events sometimes at universities. The classicists, the experts seem to say Ovid, but I stick with Ovid. See, that's hilarious to me because I always assume I mispronounce things because I grew up in Jersey and people are constantly <laughs> correcting me. But hey, if, if I'm with the classicist, there we go. All right. Now, just kind of remind people who he was and what his book Metamorphoses is. I imagine people might be familiar with it from high school or college, but if you could give us a little kind of reminder about all of this so we can get our footing, that would be great. Sure. So um, The Metamorphosis is a 12,000 line poem, which moves 
from sort of primordial chaos into, at that point, sort of current history. And it retells a lot of the Greek myths. He was a Roman poet. These were in Latin. And so it sort of moves through stories of transformation over and over again. I mean, and some of the myths are ones that I think a lot of us would be familiar with, featuring the Greek gods and goddesses that we sort of all kind of grow up having at least some passing knowledge of Zeus, Apollo, Athena, and then many, many more that are that are much lesser known. So to me, it's this beautiful, moving, sensual text. In the most basic way, it's a history. It doesn't read like that to me at all. Mm. And so much of it, as I recall, they're origin stories. It's like, exactly. how did we get this tree, this flower, this river? And it's often some being, some human, or sometimes it's a nymph or a demigod, mm. is turned into a constellation, a bush, a, a tree, a river, right? Exactly. And so that alone, I think, is so fascinating across cultures, whether we're talking about ancient Greece, ancient Rome, what have you, or any other culture around the world, there are these how did this come to be myths, and they're beautiful. Yep. But when I was reading your retelling of a lot of these myths, I was reminded by how brutal a lot of them yeah. are, too. Mm -hmm. And we'll get into some of that, but I would love to know what attracted you specifically to this text and why you thought it merited a retelling. It's a text that I will return to kind of when I'm in between books, when I just want to sort of dip into something and not to sort of sit down at the start and read through the whole thing, but to just kind of taste now and then. And there was one point where I sort of sat down with it and was looking to kind of activate some writing muscles. And I read the story of Callisto and, and you mentioned Constellation. She's turned into a bear. And as you said, these stories are brutal, a lot of them, particularly the ones about women. And the story of, you know, this woman who's punished and she's turned into a bear and then turned into a constellation. And it's this devastating story and also so beautiful. And I just was like, how would she want to tell that story? What would it sound like in her voice? Mm. And sort of immediately, I don't know, kind of welling up from somewhere, I'm not sure where, these two lines, I am a bear, I live in the sky. And from there, it was just like, all right, here we go. Mm. One of the things about it is that like, a lot of ways they sort of read the same, you know, a nymph or a goddess is being chased or pursued and either to be saved or punished, she's turned into, as you said, a rock, a river, a tree, a set of stars. The stories sort of sound the same. So what I tried to do was look for the very small details that sort of distinguished each of these figures that I retold. I have been asked about essentially suggesting that Ovid had it wrong. And of course not. I mean, the, the, like, of course not. Hmm. I think of these retellings more in conversation with Ovid than sort of saying like, this needs a rewrite, you know, like this needs to be updated. It doesn't, it's like, that didn't feel like the project to me. The project felt like a conversation, ongoing. Dialogue, it sounds dialogue. like. Yeah. Exactly. yeah. exactly. Am I correct as well in assuming that you didn't choose all of the stories, that there are some you kind of curated, you left some out, correct? That's correct. Yep. Mm -hmm. Why did you gravitate towards the characters that you did? And we should name some of them. Some will be familiar to people like Arachne and Daphne and Eurydice, Medusa, certainly. And then there are yeah. others that at least I wasn't as familiar with if I had ever heard them at all. Perhaps, you know, the first time I read Metamorphoses many, many, many moons ago. Mm -hmm. What was kind of the deciding factor for you as to what stories got your attention? Sure. So I was reading through and I was focusing on the female figures. And when one of them came along, partly it was just sort of who I could hear in my mind, who was sort of speaking to me. So it's, I mean, a little bit hard to explain this bodily experience of hearing their voices in my mind almost right away. You know, I'd read a chunk, go for a run and just kind of listen. Mm. So some right away spoke to me. Some spoke to me in a way that was sort of the way you and I would have a conversation. Some spoke to me, you know, in sort of a more ancient register and some didn't either because the stories were just too similar, 
like themes that were too similar to other characters or that just didn't quite light me up in the same way. Mm, mm. It wasn't so deliberate as to say, okay, yes to this one and no to this. It was just sort of who I could hear. Yeah. Yeah. That makes sense to me. And to your point, even though a lot of the stories might seem similar, the way that you bring us into the story is different each and every time. Mm -hmm. Sometimes, like you said, you're using kind of modern parlance. I mean, I'm thinking about the story of Scylla, you know, yep. the monstrous. And it starts where she's kind of talking to her friend and her friend has just had this horrific encounter with uh, Polyphemus. I b- believe that's the Cyclops, correct? Mm-hmm. But he's basically like bullying her and stalking her over email. Yep. And then it turns into a real world encounter that's horrific. And then Scylla has her own real world encounter. And, you know, we don't have to dance around this. I mean, we're talking about rape. We're talking about, you know, non-consensual sexual violence. I really found it so grounding to have some of these stories be modern. But I also really appreciated that you had this like lofty, poetic kind of timeless language in other stories, too. So were you hearing those voices in terms of the time period as well? Like, were they letting you know if they wanted to be a modern retelling or kind of a lyrical ancient retelling? Yeah, I mean, that was the thing. I mean, you know, with Arachne, for example, that has sort of, to my mind, a very kind of very modern conversational tone. Reading that story, it was just like, all right, who's coming up? I feel like when I explain it, I do sound a little crazy, but it sort of felt like a crazy stretch of time working on it. It just felt like, yeah, this act of listening, as I say, some presented just sort of like, all right, here we are having a conversation and some are totally different from that. Mm. It's interesting you saying about like, let's be real about this. What we're talking about is rape. Thinking about my education, I studied Latin in high school, took a bunch of Greek and Roman civ classes. I majored in classics and English in college. And these stories, we didn't talk about The fact that a lot of this is grounded on sexual violence, a lot of this is grounded on rape. And so we just read these stories and it's just like, oh, yeah, of course, of course, this is just the way it is Mm -hmm. to think about this and to sort of say, like, wow, why wasn't that addressed in the classroom? You know, like, why didn't we talk about that? And this feeling like, wow, there's something really amiss here that these foundational stories for Western civilization And to not have that addressed, to just have that assumed, like, yes, of course, this is the way it is, or spoken in such euphemism, you know, like, oh, he he attained her love. And it's just like, oh, no, man, that's not what happened here. The one that comes up all the time, at least in art history, is the word abduction. (laughs) Persephone is abducted by Hades. It's like, no, 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 (laughs) she was absolutely raped. (laughs) Yep. Yeah, yep. it's like through time translation as well. Like I have exactly. to wonder in the original language in Latin or in ancient mm-hmm. Greek, like were they more real about it and did it get softened when it was translated to different languages or, or not? I'm just not sure. Yeah, It's such a good question. There's a woman who's got a translation of the metamorphosis coming out, I think next year. Her name's Stephanie McCarter. And I feel so curious to read that translation because I know that she has been paying really close attention to those sorts of questions and those sorts of language questions, which, again, we kind of gloss over, but are so crucial to how we understand these stories. Absolutely. I was also thinking about how when I learned about Zeus or Jove, as he's called Mm -hmm. in Metamorphoses, since we're talking the Roman names, Mm -hmm. You know, it was like, ha, 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 you know, what a, what a, what a rapscallion, you know what I mean? Yeah, like, what a trickster, yeah, yeah. always changing shape and impregnating ladies, <laughs> yeah. you know? Oh, doesn't he make his wife mad? And then you're like, wait a second, he yep. would be canceled in the Me Too movement, right? He's like the Harvey Weinstein of sure. the gods. And even just like rereading him through a modern, more adult lens, I was like, man, what a motherfucker. Like, I really hate this guy. It's funny. I don't know if I have that same reaction. I don't know if I have that kind of like, wow, I hate this guy. I think it's sort of the way I sort of experience it is like, we don't know how things were. These are gods, you know, not like people. Mm -hmm. 
there's levels of complexity. I think that to me, what's so compelling is that like, what were the experiences for the people who were gods and goddesses, who were the women, who were enslaved people, you know, the people who didn't have the power and the control to tell the stories, giving voice to those people felt like exciting and powerful in its way. Mm. Can you expand on that more? Yeah. I mean, I think that... Was it exciting and powerful for you as the writer? This experience of writing Wake Siren was, was like no writing experience in my life. Like I say, once I started, it just started coming. Do you feel like it was almost like a channeled text? Yes, totally. I mean, that's how it felt. It felt like I did sort of enter this trance state, honestly. Like it felt like for three months that I was working on this, it was just like, this was it to the point where like I finished and it was just like, I didn't remember doing a lot of it. Mm. I did a spell check and sent it to my agent and then it sold. And then when it came back to me, the sort of first round of edits, like I was just like reading over it. I was like, oh fuck. Oh my (laughs) God. Yeah. And so it was this extremely bizarre bodily and out of body experience as I say, sort of listening to these women, being in dialogue with Ovid. And it just like, I mean, I guess, again, saying it out loud, it does. I'm just like, God, Nina, you sound fucking ridiculous. Nina, you're on the witch wave. So my (laughs) listeners are like super down for this. Don't you worry. I hope that I can achieve in my writing life. I hope I can achieve that experience again. It was magic. It felt like magic. Mm. As I said, the book didn't take me long to write. Three months is so fast. Oh my goodness. So fast. I mean, it just like, as I say, it just sort of fell out. But I also think that it took my entire writing career. I needed to learn and to write and to live all of what I did up until that point to be able to do it. So it did happen fast. It came out fast, but it also took, you know, my entire life. You know, I think this is a really great place to ask you to read a piece of Arachne. This is the myth of how we get the spider. Just to tee it up a little bit, she is a weaver. She's a human weaver. And if there's anything else you want to add to the story, please do before you read. So yeah, she's a weaver and she was really this young and super confident craftsperson. She sort of has this battle with Athena, who is actually the better weaver. So here's a small chunk from there. I like the loom from when I was small. I learned early and it's most of what I did. I got taught the basics. Then I taught myself more and I just kept doing and doing and I impressed my own self. I'd finish up a tapestry and I'd lay it down on the floor. I'd stand above and think, God damn, it wasn't there. Now it is. Every time it felt like a miracle. I'd look at the skeins in a heap by the loom, all their separate threads, and I'd think, God damn. First strands, one by one, then this all together, this thing whole, something out of something else. I made this transformation. The act of art is metamorphosis. It's where I found my pride. Ah, it's so gorgeous. Thank you. And it's funny, you know, I've read the whole book. I love the entire book. But that paragraph really hums for me with electricity because Mm. I just heard you, whether consciously or not, as a writer or as any of us who make things, have that experience of having that pride in our work and also having sort of that astonishment of like, I don't even know exactly where it came from, but here it is. And how miraculous is that? And it seems to me like the whole book felt that way to you. It did a little bit. And you know, it's funny. I worked as a carpenter for almost 10 years. Mm. That experience of having a pile of wood and then turning it into a deck, it did feel miraculous. You know, it really did feel like, wow, first there was nothing and now there's an entire deck totally has to do with writing and art, but I think I was absolutely thinking about the carpentry work. I carve spoons now, and I think going into a forest, coming back with some wood, shaping a spoon, it's like, first this was a tree, and now it's a spoon that I can stir my soups with. That's the most amazing thing. Well, one might even say it's a little bit like being a god, no? Sure. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Although we don't want to tempt Minerva right now. (laughs) We don't want to tempt any of them because I don't want you turning into a spider. So we're going to leave it there. (laughs) On that note, we're going to take a quick break and we'll be right back. 
You've heard me say that Mithras candles look and smell absolutely divine. But did you know that when you buy them, you are also supporting a small business that focuses on sustainable methods and ethical practices, like environmental sustainability? Using beeswax from regional honey farms, Mithras candles support the pollinators who sustain our food systems, and beeswax is a carbon-neutral source material. Mithras also supports social change. They make monthly donations for social and environmental justice to organizations like the Xerxes Society for Pollinator Conservation, the National Resources Defense Council, and the NAACP. Lastly, as if you needed even more reasons to buy Mithras candles, beeswax candles have health benefits for your body and your home too. Burning them purifies the air of dust, mold, and other pollutants, and their golden illumination allows you to do your nightly tasks without disturbing your sleep or circadian rhythms. So what are you waiting for? Buy some Mithras candles today and go to MithrasCandle.com. That's M as in magic, I-T-H-R-A-S, Candle.com. And use offer code WITCHWAVE at checkout for 15% off your first order of 2022. And be sure to follow them on Instagram at Mithras Candle. Bring Mithras Candles into your life and bask in their gorgeous glow and goodness. I'm a big fan of therapy and have seen firsthand how much talking to a professional has helped me manage my own anxiety and stress and trauma so that I can live the fullest life I possibly can. I've also seen how it's changed the lives of so many people that I care about for the better as well. And that's why I am encouraging you to check out BetterHelp which is an online counseling service that can provide you with your own licensed professional counselor to talk to via video or phone sessions. And it doesn't have to be that heavy of a topic. Maybe you just need a place to be heard and have an outside perspective on your everyday struggles with your job or your relationships. We all have so much that we're carrying with us these days between our personal issues and, need I say, global issues, and it's just a lot. And I'm telling you, talking it all through with someone who is trained and objective and not a friend or family member is such a gift because their job Their actual job is to listen to you and help you work through your feelings about it all. So please consider reaching out to the folks at BetterHelp, and they'll connect you with a counselor who you can start chatting with in under 24 hours. And they've been doing remote sessions since before it became the norm, so they've built a platform that's accessible, convenient, and secure. Also know that BetterHelp offers financial aid to those who qualify, and they make it really easy to switch counselors so you can find one that you truly click with. Best of all, Witchwave listeners get 10% off your first month of counseling by going to betterhelp.com slash witchwave. That's better, H-E-L-P dot com slash witchwave. Please take care of your mental well-being. It is so necessary, and there is absolutely support out there for you. Do what over a million people have done already, and head on over to betterhelp.com slash witchwave, find a great counselor to talk to, and know that I am here rooting for you. Feel well, and take good care with BetterHelp. Welcome back to The Witch Wave. Today, I'm speaking with Nina McLaughlin. So, Nina, I want to shift into your nonfiction writing shortly. I just have a few more things I want to discuss about Wake Siren. One of them is the fact that a lot of the goddesses, rather than helping female victims of male violations, 
they punish the victims themselves. Mm -hmm. You brought up Callisto earlier. And this story breaks my heart because listeners know I'm very devoted to Artemis, who, you know, Mm -hmm. in this telling is Diana, the Roman goddess of the moon and the hunt. And Callisto, after she is, I think she's raped or she's violated somehow, she's supposed to be a virgin when she's hanging out with Diana and all of the other nymphs. She's so ashamed that this happened to her. And when she takes off her clothes... And Diana somehow senses that she's not a virgin anymore. I mean, she just like absolutely punishes her. Right. Yeah. You know, it happens with Medusa. She has Neptune, the god of the sea, who rapes her in Minerva's temple. And (laughs) Minerva punishes Medusa and turns her into the snake-headed monstrous that we all know. Right, right. And so I was just curious about that dynamic and what you made of the female relationships of these myths. Mm -hmm. I'll say with one of the stories, the story of Echo, who's punished for sort of tricking one of the goddesses, tricking Hera, she becomes an Echo. She can only repeat what other people say. And I was thinking about this story. This is the only story in the book told from one of the sort of main pantheon's perspective. And it is told from Hera's perspective. Her husband, Zeus, is just like all the time fucking all these nymphs. At first, I was sort of feeling like, wow, these goddesses are as awful. They are as faulty and malicious and jealous as A, the male gods and B, humans. You know, I think all of the gods are as sort of flawed as we are. And so I was sort of thinking about Hera, gosh, you terrible bitch. You know? mm, mm. And as I was writing my wind into it, I started feeling much more tender for her and sort of feeling the hurt and anger that she would feel and like, how would she channel her anger? She can't kill her immortal husband. Mm. What can she do but kind of wreak havoc and destroy the lives of these women? That makes me think of the fact that often that very dynamic we see play out today. And to your point, it's usually because even if it's a semi-powerful woman who's doing the punishing, she's still often secondary, hierarchically speaking, to a more powerful man. Totally. She can't punish the abuser. And so to your point, she kicks it down the lane, Mm -hmm. so to speak. Yeah. We have talked a lot about the savagery and the brutality. There are some truly beautiful and uplifting stories in here, too. I'm thinking of the story of Pomona. I'm thinking of the mm-hmm. story of, is it Baucis? Am I pronouncing that correctly? I say Baucis, but mm-hmm. I might be wrong. I'm sure you know better <laughs> than I do. And the Baucis story, I remember that story from being a kid. And it's yeah. essentially a story about being kind to strangers, right? It's the guest host code. It's gods come in disguise and this elderly couple who don't have very much are so kind and generous with the gods that the gods that, well, I'll I'll let you tell a story actually. (laughs) Yeah, no, 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 that's totally it. I mean, this is a story that I feel like across cultures, this story exists and it is sort of gods showing up in tatters and having doors slammed in their face across villages and this welcoming couple invite them in and feed them what they have. And it's this humble meal. And I'm glad that you brought this one up because in the actual metamorphosis, that is my favorite of the entire book. Mm. And it makes me cry every time. Like, I just think it is so beautiful. So the gods present themselves finally as gods and reward them. They punish the rest of the town for dismissing them. And sort of say, how do you, you know, what what would you like? We'll give you anything. And they say, we want to die at the same moment. So it's just this absolutely beautiful love story. Two trees side by side mm. and their roots intertwine and their leaves feel each other in the in the breeze. That in some ways is the most, the most beautiful story. Oh my goodness. Well, not to make this too self-centered, but You're bringing tears to my eyes because Matt and I, my husband, we just bought a little house up in the mountains, a little escape house. And there's this one tree that's really kind of two trees, but but they're connected. And that's the tree that I've been gravitating towards to do a lot of magic. And you've just helped add this whole exquisite magical context to it. So thank you. That's so cool. That's so cool. How beautiful. So I could talk to you about Wake Siren all day, but I want to be sure that we talk about your nonfiction writing. 
you are someone whom I consider to be an absolute master of what a lot of people now call the lyric essay. When I was coming up, it was called creative nonfiction. Mm-hmm. I, I don't know how you describe it. Getting back to Arachne, it really feels like you weave together this tapestry of personal reflection, snippets of poetry, quotes from mm. writers across histories, science, folklore. You blend together so beautifully the mundane and the magical. And you're often writing about nature, moments in the year. You have a series on the full moon that you've been writing for a while. Mm -hmm. Your nonfiction writing first came to my attention in the Paris Review, where you do a lot of this writing for a series you did on the summer solstice, which was also collected in a book. It's a beautiful Mm -hmm. jewel of a book. So I just love to invite you to talk about how you started this series or this multi-series now of writing, would you categorize it kind of broadly on nature or how do you talk about it? Yeah, that's a good question. You know, the first series I did for the Paris Review was a series of essays about the month of November, which I love. I love November. I love the sort of magic of the light, the stilling of the year. There's a real potency. And I think that the essays that I've done for them since then, I mean, they, gosh, they all are on sort of natural themes. Like, I don't think of it as nature writing. I think they could be described that way. I don't think of them like that. I think that they come from, what am I aiming my attention on? What do I want to aim my attention on? You know, what would be cool for my own brain to explore and to write about? It's super pagan, I have to (laughs) say. (laughs) Yeah, definitely. It's like the mystery and the magic of yeah. time and how time yeah. changes and how we experience that time. That's so nice to hear because I feel like that's exactly what I'm trying to kind of excavate for my own self all the time. How do we make sense of change? How do we make sense of transformation? The changing of the seasons, the changing of the light. I think the solstices are such such potent moments of the year, you know, where it is, we're moving sort of from one half to the other and sort of these days that kind of hold both bright light and real extreme darkness. Yeah. Let me interrupt you with you. You write, the solstice is a special day, irregular, when doors swing open that are otherwise closed. You know, I sort of over relied on my brain, you know, that there was this kind of like, oh, I can just sort of think my way through something as I've continued to write, as I've gotten older. It's sort of learning how to hear both the bodily knowledge and also aiming my attention out to sort of the natural world, to the sky, to the moon, to the plants, the trees. And it is stuff that we can't explain in words all the time. Mm. There's a song I've been listening to a ton these days by Bill Callahan. and I- <gasps> He is my dude. Oh my gosh, really? Uh, he's like, um, like in my top three favorite musicians. Oh my gosh, fantastic. Honestly, the song I've been listening to over and over again these last days, it's, I think it's called From the Rivers to the Seas. Mm. The repeated line is, have faith in wordless knowledge again and again, have faith in wordless knowledge. And it just feels so right on. And there's this line too, that it's like, I could tell you about the river or we could just get in. And it's just like, (sighs) oh yeah. So I think what I'm trying to do with this mode of writing is like, there's stuff we don't understand. You know, there's really stuff that can't quite be explained. And so trying to get as close as I can in words to the stuff that can't be explained in words. And also realizing that there's a limit to it. The poet Charles Simic says that the highest states of consciousness are wordless. I might be screwing up that quote. <laughs> Which would be kind of perfect. <laughs> 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 but yeah, so it is like the mysteries. There's stuff that we don't understand. And I think that's where I feel sort of most excited to be dwelling in mentally and sort of physically these days. Mm. On that note, we're going to take another quick break and we'll be right back. This episode of The Witch Wave is brought to you by Crystal Garden Creations. Sammy from Crystal Garden Creations is an intuitive jewelry designer creating unique crystal jewelry for those looking to add a little more grounding and positivity into their life. Sammy is all about the balance of the positive and shadow in their work and in their life. 
They work with raw stones as they feel that they are more connected to nature when working with them. Crystal Garden Creations is a queer-owned business based in the suburbs of New York, and all of the crystals are Reiki-blessed and infused with the intention of love and light and to help you with whatever you need on your journey. And all orders come with free crystals. Everything from Crystal Garden Creations is handmade by Sammy, and they have been running the shop solo for nine years. And they are extending 13% off to all Witchwave listeners with the code WITCHWAVE for the entire month of February and March. Sammy also takes custom requests and commissions and truly enjoys working alongside people to bring their beautiful visions to life. And they are also doing distance Reiki sessions via video call. For more information or to book a session, email them at crystalgardencreations17 at yahoo.com or you can check out their Etsy shop, which is etsy.com slash shop slash crystalgardenc. That's crystalgarden and the letter C. And you can find them at Instagram at crystal underscore garden underscore creations. And remember to head on over to the Crystal Garden Creation Shop on Etsy and use offer code WITCHWAVE for 13% off February and March 2022 orders. The Path 365, Daily Direction for Ladies and Mothers, Witches and Others, is a book that allows you to open your mind, body, and spirit to a path that is uniquely yours. As a gateway spirituality guide, it weaves coping mechanisms identified in neuroscience and mental health that address mind, body, and spirit, and incorporates them into an easy-to-read daily guide. Author Susie Newell received her doctorate from the University of Cincinnati with a focus on coping mechanisms. This book gently encourages people to open their mind to a spiritual path that feels right for them. Like a daily oracle read for the soul, The Path 365 takes you through a journey of positive self-discovery and encourages you to incorporate your practice into every aspect of your being. Whether you have a solid spiritual practice already or are exploring your options, The Path 365 is a unique guide to creating a path of your own. Visit them at thepath365.com for ordering options. And be sure to use code WITCHWAVE for free shipping. And you can give The Path 365 a follow on your favorite social media platform. We are all in this thing together. Create a path that works for you. Would you like even more WITCHWAVE? Then come join us on Patreon, where you'll get bi-weekly bonus Witch Wave Plus episodes, ad-free Witch Wave episodes, and detailed show notes for all. Rewards also include magical merch and giveaways, early heads up about my workshops before they sell out, and all backers get access to our exclusive digital coven, where I lead monthly rituals and video chats, and where you can connect to a community of other wonderful witches. So head on over to patreon.com slash witchwave and sign up. It's a fabulous way to get more magic in your life and to support the show. Thanks so much. Welcome back to The Witch Wave. Today, I'm speaking with Nina McLaughlin. So, Nina, we're talking about the lyric essays that you've been writing, and you've been writing them kind of as like variations on a theme, and you started listing some of them. I have, I think, the full list here. Stop me if I'm forgetting anything. You have a series on November. You have a series on dawn, on summer solstice, the sky, winter solstice, and you're currently in the middle of writing your way through what you call the moon in full. So how do you decide which series you want to dive into? 
that's part one of the question. And mm-hmm. the second is, you know, some of these have built in structure. I'm assuming you're going to write 12 essays about the full moon. Maybe I'm wrong or maybe 13, depending. But is there just a certain limit you're given or are you instinctively just writing for as long as you need to for some of these themes? It varies. Sometimes it's been me saying to the editors I've been working with, sort of saying, I've got an idea for the summer solstice, for example, for essays, you know, one per week leading up to the solstice. And when I was working on that one, for example, I was thinking of that, though it was appearing over four weeks, thinking of it as one long essay. And I tried to do the same with with the winter solstice. With the Dawn series, that was an editor's idea. And former editor Naja Spiegelman came to me with that and sort of said, how's five essays on this topic? And I was just like, great. All right, here we go. And with the Moon, 12 essays, there's two left of the series for that. You know, that's been a larger scale project that I sort of pitched to them. You know, how about one full moon piece per month? Gorgeous. Let me read an excerpt from a piece that you wrote in October for Hunter's Moon. You write, the moon is presumed mute. Its silence is the silence of death. But when it does speak, it speaks in the language of shadows. You speak this language too. It was your first language, our shared first language, the language of the dark. Ah, so, so beautiful. And it reminds me also of the moon card in tarot and how the moon is so much associated in tarot with like darkness and it's still light but it's like a deep light it's a a light Mm. almost that feels thonic if you will Mm -hmm. and so how has writing the moon affected you you can interpret (laughs) that any which way you want great question yeah i mean i love this idea of a deep light I think that, again, aiming my attention at the moon, you might have been the same. Like, I'm definitely someone who I prefer winter, fall and winter to sort of spring and summer. I like the darker half of the year. I don't know much about tarot. I don't know much about astrology. But it is this sort of feeling of like, yeah, okay, this thing has got to be affecting us. You know, it seems to me so thick headed to think that this isn't impacting our experience in perhaps subtle ways, but impacting it nonetheless. I think it has made me more awake and attuned to the world at night, sort of moving through, especially at the beginning of the pandemic, I would go for these night walks Mm. and just sort of, you know, looking up, looking where's the moon and feeling in those moments, the sense of when everything was feeling so kind of upside down and frightening, looking up and saying, okay, wow, like there's the moon, like these cycles are continuing, there's stuff, there's rhythms taking place that are so much bigger than what's going on right now. And as frightening and as sort of full of question marks as as it is, um, it was a way to sort of feel grounded by that. Like there's the moon, it's waxing or it's waning or it's full. And sort of feeling this both pulled out of myself and also very much grounded and calmed by it. So it seems this kind of to me, I guess, as I've deepened my relationship with it, this really mysterious, benevolent force, not in this cheerful way, but in this kind of detached, dreamlike way almost. But I do think that there's a kindness to the moon. Mm. Oh, how I love that. It's so (laughs) interesting because hearing you speak about it just now, I had this kind of realization that the moon is traditionally talked about as I mean, there's that Shakespeare quote, right? It's Mm -hmm. inconstant Mm -hmm. from Romeo and Juliet. Mm -hmm. And I will not try to quote it exactly, but, you know, and the sun is supposed to be more constant. And yet Mm -hmm. I'm thinking about how in the northern hemisphere, our seasons are opposite of each other. And yet our moon phases are always the same. When I'm looking at a full moon up here, someone in Australia is seeing that full moon even if we're celebrating different pagan holy days around it, right? right? And so in some ways that feels almost more consistent to me than the sun on this earth. Totally, totally. And I think that kind of like cheesy, cliche, like sort of romantic idea of, you know, we're all under the same moon. There's something actually so beautiful about that. And really, I don't know, moving and connective. 
I mean, it doesn't have to be sort of romantic. It could be like a, a friend far away. You know, it's we're both looking up. There's sort of this beautiful triangles are created, these beautiful circles. Mm. Yes, yes, yes. Speaking of the word connective, you strike me as someone who is a voracious, I might even say a promiscuous reader. (laughs) And I was thinking about the designer Alan Fletcher, and he refers to himself as a visual jackdaw. And I Mm. think of you as a literary jackdaw, just like this total magpie. Like I was trying to just jot down a list of some of your reference points, and my list looks like this. D.H. Lawrence quotes poetry by Emily Dickinson, fragments of Japanese folklore or Aztec mythology, detailed scientific explanations on menstruation or plant growth, snippets of songs, and then many of your own anecdotes of meeting a stranger, swimming in Walden Pond, or cutting fresh tomatoes. I mean, you're really eclectic, which is my favorite kind of brain. It's my favorite kind of way to write and approach the world. And I love other writers who do that too, who make these connections. But just from like a dorky kind of craft perspective, I'm wondering how you organize all of these resources. Are you just like an incredibly diligent note taker? Or is it just when you have a topic at hand, you kind of swim throughout all your texts and let them come to you in the moment? Yeah. So that's in some ways, some of the most fun that I have with it. You know, for example, with this moon project, knowing that I was going to be doing that, I sort of, everything I read, I'll read with a moon lens. Like, it's amazing what you sort of see when you're looking for it. So sometimes like I'll seek out research on menstruation. That's not just sort of like at the tip of my fingers. And other times it is sort of the luck of having things cross my path that I can sort of file away and say like, oh yeah, perfect. Like, I don't know how I'll use this yet, but this will get woven in somewhere. And so keeping little notes, sending myself millions of emails. (laughs) And so it's- I use that technique too. And I'm always like, Grossman, get it together. (laughs) You need a better system. (laughs) Um, But it does feel like it's this kind of accumulation when I'm working on something. And sort of, again, it's like this lens comes over- my eyes where it's like, like seeing it's, it's like, wow, I, there's some phrase about, you know, you, when you just learn a word, you start to hear it all the time. Oh, and so it's, oh it's, I feel like it's like, I'm going to get this wrong, but like paradelia or it's something in that genre. Right. It sort of feels like that, you know, it's like when I'm sort of focused on a project like this, that's the lens through which I'm doing all my reading. Paradolia, that is the word. So in some ways it feels that some of it is just very instinctive and synchronistic too. It's not, Mm -hmm. is that right? It does feel instinctive and it does feel like lucky. You know, there are some times where I'm like, oh my gosh, great timing. Mm -hmm. And there's other times where it is more deliberately. I return to the books that are kind of my touchstones. You know, there's some haiku that I always return to. Octavio Paz is someone I return to a lot, the Mexican poet. And so there's places that I drop into where I know I can find places that will underline the stuff I'm trying to get at. So winding down a bit, unfortunately, as I feel like this whole conversation is about three seconds long, but I'd love to hear how you're feeling about magic in relation to your process of writing these days. Earlier in the conversation, you sounded a little, I don't know if embarrassed is the right word, but I know we're taught to have this very academic approach to our writing. And yet it does sound to me, based on what you said earlier and based on what you write about, that you have some kind of predilection or affinity towards magic. Yeah, definitely. And I think that it does feel sort of new for me. And I haven't talked out loud a lot about it. I do feel kind of stammery and and a little shy about it because I haven't done a lot of speaking about it. And in some ways it feels private, you know, and I don't know quite how to articulate it. But I think that to go back to what I was saying before a little bit, there is a lot we don't understand. And I think that our minds and our bodies are capable of way more than we think they are. And I think that trusting the sort of instinctual, trusting the body, the things we know without knowing we know, there's a way to sort of skate on the surface. I don't quite know how to put words to it yet in the sort of, (laughs) 
I don't know, tissue of existence. I'm not sure. Um, I love that tissue of existence. I do think there's magic. I don't know. I feel so lucky to walk outside every time I do and like, wow, look up at the sky, no matter what. It's like, that's great. That's lucky. There's magic there. Just sort of being awake to this stuff. And it's so easy not to be awake. Mm. And I sense so much magic in you and in your writing. I'm so grateful for it. Nina, please tell me you have more books coming out and please (laughs) tell us how we can find the books that are already out and your essays and your social media if you care to share that too. Sure. So Wake Siren, Summer Solstice, and I wrote a book, a memoir about leaving my journalism job to learn carpentry called Hammerhead. Those can all be found at your favorite independent bookstore. I am working on some other projects right now. A lot of these essays, you'll find them at the Paris Review site. I have a website, ninamclaughlin.com. It's very rudimentary. Twitter and Instagram and stuff is just, just my name. Yeah. Perfect. Well, Nina, I just adore everything you make. Like, truly, I'm such a fangirl. I can't wait to read your next moon and all of the other luminous writing to come. Thank you so much for being on The Witch Wave. Thank you, Pam. This was such a pleasure. I really, really appreciate it. That's it for the show. Thank you again to Nina McLaughlin for changing me and this world for the better. Do you have questions, feedback, need some witchly advice, or just want to share something magical that happened to you recently? Drop us an email at witchwavepodcast at gmail.com. We'd love to hear from you, and you just might make it on The Witch Wire. The Witch Wave is a phantasmophile production written and produced by me, Pam Grossman. This episode was recorded and edited by Josh Wilcox and myself. Our theme music is the song Hand and I by Lycanthia. Special thanks go to Matt Freeman, Laura Antal, and Cece Pascal. You can check out information about this and other episodes on our website and now by Witchwave merch at witchwavepodcast.com. Please subscribe to us on your favorite podcast app and give us lots of sparkly stars. It really, truly makes a difference and helps other people find the show. You can follow us on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook at witchwavepod. And you can check out my witch emoji for iPhone by going to witchemoji.com or downloading it in the App Store. Please consider ordering my book, Witchcraft, or picking up my book, Waking the Witch, which is available everywhere now. And if you want more Witch Wave or you would just like to support the show, please join us over on Patreon. That's patreon.com slash witchwave. Thank you so much for listening. Witches are the future. I'll catch you next time on The Witch Wave.